we want to do some more advanced root locus controller design. So we can barely call it design so far. We were just varying the gain, um, but it's fruitless if we would like our closed loop system behavior to require roots that are not on the root locus, right? If they're not on the root locus, varying the gain will have no effect. Or, well, it will have an effect, but it won't have the effect we want. We'll never get there by varying the gain. So, if we allow our controller to be something a bit more complex than a simple gain, we can change the shape of the root locus itself such that we can choose an appropriate gain for the desired performance. So, in this chapter, <clears throat> this is chapter 9 of Nice. We'll explore several controller types PI controller and lag controllers that are analogous uh, to PI controllers that improve steady state behavior. So, there's always an analogy here. There's always the sort of pure version, and then there's the less pure version that is um, something that you can create in a uh, passive circuit. So there's the, the PI one is the one that's like the pure integrator is in there, proportional and an integrator. Um, and then lag, which is not quite an in a pure integrator, but it's close to a pure integrator. Okay, so these improve steady state behavior. Um, PD and lag, or sorry, and lead controllers uh, improves transient behavior. That's mainly their, their, uh, their goal. And so you can do a straight PI or a straight PD. Um, and finally, you could put them all together into a PID. Uh, or analogously, you could do a lead lag controller to improve both. Um, not to say, I mean, sometimes uh, it's, it's sort of accidental, though. So you can, you can do a PD controller. Um, you can do a PD controller that actually improves steady state behavior, like a PI controller does. But it's accidental. It's like just not the typical way to go with it. Um, it isn't. It has a sort of an unpredictable. I mean, it's predictable if you work out the math. But from a designer standpoint, it's kind of an unpredictable effect on on the steady state behavior if you do if you have make a PD controller. Um, so that's the way to think about these is that, okay, PI and lag, they're geared towards steady state. PD and lead, those are geared towards transient. And then PID sort of and, and lag lead uh, or lead lag, uh, put them all together. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through in detail. I kind of did... I kind of did this a little bit earlier, but I, I kind of glossed on this. Um, transient response is going to be a big part of this. We need to make sure we have the transient response stuff down because I'm constantly going to be saying, design this for this rise time or this settling time. So we, we better understand how that's related to parameters we care about. So I'm just going to go through it a little bit more tightly toothed comb, finely toothed comb. Uh, they are. So uh, our primary uh, considerations, transient response, are based on second order, second order assumption. Remember, it doesn't always second order, but oftentimes we still use this and, in hopes that it will behave closely enough, and we can base those hopes on some expectations based on the, the pole locations. Um, relative pull locations uh, on the second order. So we're going we're gonna to make that assumption a lot of times, and we're going to say, okay, rise time. Remember, it's the time to go from 10% to 90%. Um, no closed form solution, but there's a figure in Nice. So look it up, and that will be where we'll, we'll use that. Uh, peak time. Time required to reach the first or maximum peak. So there it is. Percent overshoot is related to the damping ratio, like this. Settling time, the time required for the transients 
damped oscillations to reach and stay within 2% of the steady state value. And that's this. So you see the rise and then it isn't in 2% and then up oh, starting here it goes within 2%. So these different parameters are going to be used a lot and I want you guys to be familiar with them. Um, I also included them here to give you sort of one-stop shop for all things to do with root locus design um, uh, evaluation. So we needed to determine how well we're doing with our designs. Um, so transient response control is about getting uh, uh, is about selecting closed loop pole locations that yield the desired transient response. Probably don't need both getting and selecting in the same sentence. Um, the figures A and B to the right here from Nice show that designing for a faster settling time can be achieved at pole location A. Um, whoa. I like I'm like we're on we're on hour six of lecturing today for me. And I have to admit that my mind is going a little bit mush at this point. So we're gonna try to we try to make it through the rest of this with some degree of of uh of uh sanity left in my mind here. So we'll start that sentence over. The figures at right show that designing for a faster settling time than can be achieved at pole location A requires a pole location such as B that isn't on the root locus. So, what we have here is a root locus in teal, we'll call it, and we want a settling time at B. So A is the closest that we can get on the root locus to B, but we can't get to B. And so, uh, oh, settling time is related to zeta omega n, which is the distance from zero to the pole location, the real part of that. Uh, this is just, oh, so we wanted a faster settling time than we had. So the settling time, maybe the best settling time we could get to on this was, uh, well, the best settling time is, is probably like right around here, I guess. So furthest to the left that we can get, but... Uh, maybe there were some other characteristics that were not quite what we wanted. So we, for whatever reason, we ended up with saying, okay, we want, so this would be, this is a constant line of damping right here. This ray, any ray that starts at the origin and goes outwards from the origin, the straight line, is a constant damping ray. So that's also a constant percent overshoot. So maybe there was some design percent overshoot that we wanted, and that's why we're on this ray. And so we're saying, okay, we can be on this ray with that percent overshoot, um, but the settling time isn't what we want. We want there to be a, a faster settling time. And so say we wanted a settling time of whatever, whatever it was set to. So settling time back up here, uh, there it is. Oh, it's right there. I went scrolling for no reason. So 4 over zeta omega n. Whoa. There it is. 4 over zeta omega n. So the larger zeta omega n is, the smaller the settling time. So that we want to move this to the left and we are, uh, say we wanted to get, I don't know, we chose B because maybe we wanted like one-third the settling time. 
And this would be, that, this looks like it's about three times further to the left. Maybe somewhere between two and three. Um, so that might be why we chose B. Because it's on the ray, it's the same percent overshoot, but it's at a different settling time, a faster settling time. Yeah. So that's just the horizontal distance, right? Not the, like, right, the real, the real part. That's right. Yeah. Um, you said that each ray is a constant percent overshoot. Yeah. Um, is there a correlation about how percent or overshoot uh, rises or falls as you go move around the circle? Yeah. Is there one point where it's always the smallest? So the way that I remember is that if you went all the way vertical, then you would be talking about a marginally stable system that's just going to oscillate, right? Um, and if you went all the way to the axis, the real axis, then you would have a, a, a um, just an exponential decay. You have no overshoot. So no overshoot is the, uh, the ray that's something like this. This is like a very low overshoot, or percent overshoot ray. Uh, this is a very high percent overshoot ray. Okay. So that furthest left point in this case was both the smallest settling time and the lowest overshoot. Before we picked point B, you said that the, the left edge of that root locus was the smallest settling yeah. time. Yeah. It's also the overshoot. So yeah, so this is... Uh, so. This overshoot, is, it's like a medium overshoot, because it's a ray in the middle. Um, and an array, you know, so a, a ray that's that's totally vertical, like I said, would be like would overshoot maximally, you could say. And this would overshoot minimally, but it also has other characteristics we might not like. For instance, it's going to be slow. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, there are other aspects of what we might not like about it. Um, typically, you're always trading off uh, speed of response and overshoot and sometimes control effort. And so there's like all these things you're kind of trading off. And, and thinking in terms of second order systems, um, and where geometrically where things lie in here is is helpful so yeah the settling time is something that we often care quite a bit about and the settling time is how far left we are is so better it's, it's smaller the further left we go the ray the constant rays of percent overshoot we talked about and um, Rise time, unfortunately, doesn't have a nice geometric relationship, so that one's a little tougher. But you can specify it does. It is relate to zeta and omega n. Um, you just have to look at the figure. So okay, uh, good. So question is, how can we make the root locus go through b? So we want it to go through B. Like we determined that our transient response characteristics that are desirable uh, tell us that we need to go through B. So if we want to do that, how are we going to move the root locus to go through B? I mean, that's kind of like the, the question. Um, we can't do it by changing the gain. It just moves us along along the root locus, so we can never get there. So, the answer requires root locus design. Transient response control may affect the steady state response. We will treat them separately at first, then discuss how to treat them at the same time. So you can talk about the transient response control and the steady state response control um, in the same discussion, but that it takes. We're going to separate them out at first, and we're just going to deal with them each individually. So, steady state response control. When controlling for steady state, we would like to minimize the steady state error. We've already learned how to minimize steady state error. 
add integrators, right? Which are just pulls at the origin. So just add some integrators and you get rid of steady state error. This will remain our strategy for PI and PID control with some nuance. And we will place a pull just left of the origin for lag control. So lag control is, says, okay, we don't have a pure integrator. We have one that's close. It's like it's it's like maybe um, we will have a, a pull that's at like negative 0 0.2. There's a real number of negative 0 0.2. And that's like that's not zero which would be an integrator, but it's close to being an integrator. And so dynamically, it behaves very similar to how an integrator behaves. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm going to explain more in detail how to do all of that. This is like an overview. Configurations. The, con the figure at right shows two different configurations for compensators. Um, here we are considering the original controller to be simply a gain k. For this reason we're designing a compensator for the controller. So this is there you see these two different terms flying around a lot in controls. You see, you see controller and you see compensator. And the meaning of that is that okay, say that we had an original controller that's a gain k. Then when we, we add on um, integral or derivative or lag or lead or some combination of those, then we're thinking of it as being a compensator for that. And that's actually how we go through the design process. That's why we think of them as being compensators. Although to, in aggregate, when we bundle it all together, it becomes our controller. Okay, So we think of the integrator as being an integral compensator and a derivative compensator or a lag compensator, that type of thing. So that's why we talk like that. <clears throat> Other times we drop this charade, <laughs> I like saying it like that, and simply say we're designing a controller, because we are. I mean, that's, it's just the use of the term compensator is common, so I thought it would be important to say it's really interesting because space is very nonlinear when you think about the uh, size of things, right? My hand is like this, and then like I just waved it, and I was like, whoa, it came at me on my screen really fast. Very nonlinear. Perspective is interesting. In A, this figure up here, the cascade compensator is placed in the forward path. So, we have the original controller, which we're saying is just going to be a gain k for our analysis in this root locus section. And we're going to have a plant, g, and then the cascade compensator is what we're going to be designing, g1. Okay. And then in the end, we'll end up just combining the cascade compensator and the original controller into one controller. Okay, that's where we head with it, but this is the way that we think about it, is that, oh, there's an original just a gain controller, and then we put in this cascade compensator in there. It's the way that it's conceptually thought about. You can also put in a feedback compensator. So some... <clears throat> Some folks like to consider, like to think in terms of a feedback compensator, and that's totally valid. There's no problem with that. However, we are mostly going to take the perspective of having a uh, uh, a cascade compensator and not a feedback compensator. They're both valid and they're equivalent. Um, I so it turns out you can actually you can just rearrange this into this and this into that pretty easily so I don't deal much with this one um, I prefer talking about this in this class but we'll occasionally dabble with it I think I might give you guys a homework on it um, 
Active versus passive compensation. So ideal controllers use pure integrators and differentiators. These require active networks and usually include, or that usually include separate power supplies. Um, <clears throat> passive compensation can approximate the behavior of an ideal controller with passive elements such as resistors and capacitors, which is nice, like we talked about. Okay, so that is the end of this one. And I'm going to check and see if this